If you've ever found yourself totally absorbed in a game and unable to put it down, then you were probably the victim of a tightly designed gameplay loop. Gameplay loops come in all sizes and forms, but they almost always involve a cycle of events that feed into some grander sense of progression. Roguelites are masters of the gameplay loop, featuring short game sessions that are followed by some form of meta progression, which then sucks you back in for just one more run. The Rogue Legacy games task you with exploring a massive castle as you loot it for gold. When you die, you can spend all of your coins on leveling up your character. And of course, once you do this, you'll probably be eager to give the game another go to try out all the new goodies you just purchased. The traditional Zelda games have a tried and true gameplay loop. You explore the overworld, find a dungeon, which contains some new tool that changes how you can interact with the world. You then use this new tool to conquer the dungeon and its boss, and then go back to exploring the overworld again. In some games, this core loop lasts for only a few minutes, while in others, it can last for several hours. Games aren't limited to a single loop either. Many of them have loops within their loops. Identifying these structures in video games is largely subjective, but is nevertheless a useful tool in breaking down what makes a game engaging for players. Recently, I replayed SteamWorld Dig 2 for the first time since it was released in 2017. It's a well-reviewed Metroidvania by Image Inform Games, the studio behind all of the very excellent SteamWorld games. I remember enjoying the game, but being a little confused about why I enjoyed it. Because ultimately, the SteamWorld Dig games are mostly about, well, digging. Patrick! What are you doing here? Digging. Why? Huh, I don't know. Now, five years later, and with a better understanding of what makes my favorite games tick, I can finally articulate just what made SteamWorld 2 so compelling. It has one of the tightest, most well-executed game loops I've seen. SteamWorld Dig 2 has a simple premise. Your buddy from the first game has gone missing, and you're off on a journey to find him. Your quest brings you to a small mining town to investigate tremors coming from the caverns below. You start off with a simple pickaxe and lantern, and you get to digging. You'll descend through a long vertical shaft, in which nearly every block is destructible, so it's entirely up to you to carve your own path to the bottom. Along the way, you'll find various traps, enemies, and blocks that contain precious metals. As you dig, you'll need to strategize to avoid accidentally sending boulders crashing down on valuable resources, or yourself. You'll often see something of interest just outside of your reach, and you'll need to retrace your steps and form a plan to get there. You begin with some hefty limitations on your health, how long your lantern will last, and how many resources you can hold. Inevitably, one of these restrictions will force you to return to the surface, where you can cash in all of the precious gemstones you found for money. You can then spend all of this money on a plethora of upgrades. You can buy a better pickaxe to break through blocks faster, or you can increase the number of resources that you can hold, or you can buy a lantern that will last longer. Spending your money on upgrades is always satisfying, because everything you buy will help you explore the mines more efficiently. Once you've emptied your wallet, you'll be eager to dive back down in search of more treasure. So far, the gameplay loop I've described is pretty simple. Dig, find treasure, return to the surface, buy upgrades, and dig again. But SteamWorld Dig 2 also manages to seamlessly integrate Metroidvania upgrades and puzzles into this loop. As you dig downward, you'll occasionally find doors that lead to self-contained side areas. These rooms let you stop and take a break from meticulous spelunking by presenting you with platforming challenges and puzzles. A few of these areas will reward you with a new ability, ranging from pressure bombs, to a jackhammer, to the coveted grappling hook. All of these new powers enable you to better explore the mines and extract more resources. Like any good Metroidvania, the level design will evolve side by side with your mobility. When you start off with just your pickaxe, you're limited to digging downward into the side. You can break one tile above you, but you have no way to use your pickaxe in midair, so you'll mostly need to approach your problems from above. The pressure bomb can extend your reach to two tiles in any direction, and you can upgrade it to extend its range even farther. After you've found the hook shot, you're able to cling to walls to launch yourself vertically or horizontally. Soon after, you'll find yourself slinging through the caves, sniping these bomb bats from afar, and strategically knocking them into each other or into blocks to blow them up. Then they start adding in conveyor belts and crushers for you to navigate through, all while you maneuver around these crates. The next thing you know, you're in a horizontal corridor, navigating above pools of lava and dodging enemy attacks from above. Even the world map has taken on more of a metroidvania structure when compared to the first game, which was mostly just a straight shot down to the end. You'll explore roughly four different underground areas, as well as some of the desert that connects them. 
Along the way, you'll occasionally reach dead ends and use newfound abilities to discover new ways forward. All the standard Metroidvania fare. In addition to the occasional movement upgrade, you'll find many optional side rooms that contain a puzzle or two to test the abilities that you've already found. These caves will reward your curiosity with valuable gems, upgrade cogs, and if you look carefully enough, artifacts. Upgrade cogs are kind of like extra slots that you can use to equip various perks, things like letting your pickaxe deflect enemy projectiles or reducing fall damage. Each perk will cost a set number of cogs to equip, so you'll want to find as many cogs as possible to equip lots of goodies. Artifacts are extra well-hidden collectibles that usually offer some humorous reference to well-known video games or other pop culture. Finding them lets you unlock new perks to equip with your upgrade cogs, and locating them all will unlock a brutal endgame challenge that will put all of your skills and abilities to the test. These side caves are the perfect opportunity for the game to expand upon some of the mechanics that you've already been introduced to. You'll have already met these exploding bats by this point, and you've probably figured out by now that you can use your hookshot to knock them into walls to blow them up. But this puzzle demands that you lure a bat from below into just the right spot to hit this crack in the wall. These caves will usually contain an upgrade cog as a reward for reaching the end, but careful exploration will almost always reveal an artifact or a second, more well-hidden cog somewhere along the way. Deep exploration of each cave feels rewarding as finding more cogs will let you equip more upgrades, turning you into a spelunking powerhouse. What makes this all work so well is how everything that you find contributes something meaningful to the core gameplay loop of exploration and then upgrading. Gems are great because they allow you to improve your pickaxe, backpack, and lantern. Abilities like the hookshot, pressure bomb, and jetpack give you more flexibility in how you explore the underground and mine for gems. Upgrade cogs allow you to equip more upgrades, which give you benefits that improve your survivability and let you more efficiently collect gems. Even killing enemies grants you experience, and when you earn enough to level up, the resources that you find will yield more value. Because all of these feed into your primary goal of exploration and resource gathering, not a single discoverable feels unsatisfying. The level design also has this way of pulling you along, always keeping something interesting in the corner of your eye. Mine some treasure from a resource block, and you can be sure that you'll see another one at the edge of the screen. Except, now your backpack is getting kind of full, and your lantern is running low on oil so you might want to turn back soon. But looking at your map, you can see there's a new fast travel point if you dig just a bit deeper, so you really should just press on a bit further. But then as you dig, you find more gems that you have to ignore because your bag is full, and look, now there's a cave to explore too. Finally, you're able to fast travel back to town, cash in your gems, buy some upgrades, and refuel. It's the perfect time to save your game and take a break. But now you've got all the resources you left behind and that new cave sitting in the back of your head, so maybe you should head back down just one more time, real quick and wrap things up, just so you don't forget. And so the cycle continues. SteamWorld Dig 2 is a shining example of everything that a sequel should be. It takes the fundamentals of the first game and expands upon them in all of the right ways. It's a rare case of a sequel that adds more collectibles, movement upgrades, and branching paths without any of it feeling like fluff or changing the game's core identity. Each of these additions contributes meaningfully to the game's core of exploration and powering up, resulting in a refined, no-frills gameplay loop that will continue to reel you back in throughout its roughly 10-hour runtime. I guess all I'm really trying to say here is that I really dig this game. 